<coughs> with this playbook, and we are distributing this uh, to you today, we are offering common sense proposals that recognize a new fiscal reality. While school officials are holding spending to a minimum, tapping over a billion dollars in, res in reserves that will be proposed at May 17th, exhausting federal stimulus funds, and negotiating concessions with employees, state mandates significantly reduce our options. As a result, many districts are forced to cut programs and lay off employees. We have identified seven key cost drivers that should be reformed now if there is any hope of cutting costs without decimating school programs and laying off thousands of hardworking employees. Collectively, these seven items account for millions of dollars in school spending every year. We think there is a better way one that would save programs and jobs. But our way will require changes in state law, and they will draw sharp rebuke from politically potent forces. I want to make it clear, school boards are pro-children and pro-jobs. We want every school to provide a high-quality, affordable program within a safe learning environment where every employee in every school district is the best person for that particular job. Our reforms should draw wide-ranging support from parents, taxpayers, school officials, newly appointed teachers, and others who believe that the needs of students should be paramount to school district resource planning. We have already seen our legislative support for addressing last in, first out, which is one of the elements we have here, and 3020A, the system by which we uh, discipline tenured teachers. Uh, the Tier 5 pension proposals, reforms I should say, that were ushered in last year disappoint, disappointed many of us. But it showed that the legislature does recognize the need for pension reform. They just didn't go far enough. The Board of Regents is already beginning to introduce special education regulatory relief measures. Our essential fiscal reform playbook contains briefing materials, sample legislative language, and a sample sponsor's memo. If we can do it, they can do it. Uh, it was believed it, is, it will be delivered to every legislator today. The governor has already received his copy, as has Larry Schwartz, who is an advisor to the governor and is heading up the mandate relief redesign team, of which I am a member, uh, and other state officials. Uh, and we will request opportunities to meet with legislators and other leaders uh, to advocate for these positions while there is still time in this particular legislative session. I will now quickly brief you on the key elements of each of these seven sections that are contained in the NISBA Essential Fiscal Reforms Playbook and answer any of your questions. If you go to open up the book, you're going to see that we start off by giving you a letter that uh, kind of lays forth the purpose, the rationale, why we are presenting this book at this time. We then have gotten a little bit creative. You'll notice that we've used artwork that is uh, similar to what you would see among a, in, a, in a athletic playbook, and we've got artwork in here that identifies every one of these issues as a particular play on a football field. For example, the Triborough Amendment we've identified as delay of game, and, uh, and likewise as you go through this. Uh, if you turn to the Triborough Amendment, you're going to see here, uh, uh, first off, a uh, little background information, what our objective is. You're going to see a sample uh, memo of support that somebody who would be sponsoring this legislation might uh, borrow from and you're going to see the legislation that we would support or suggest ourselves. I want to make it perfectly clear on Triborough, and this is, a, this is a, the beginning of what I think is a very reasonable set of proposals. We are not calling for the repeal of Triborough. We are calling for an amendment to Triborough. What we want to do is level the playing field, no pun intended. Um, we want to say that when a contract, a labor agreement, expires, everyone keeps their job, 
everyone keeps their benefits, everyone keeps their pension, but we freeze wages and salaries. There's no movement, uh, no automatic step increases that one would get by being on payroll for another year. There's no movement laterally across the lanes that make up a teacher salary schedule from one, one lane to the other. It freezes. Wage freeze until we have a new contract. This is our way of making sure that those bargaining units that are working with an expired contract come back to the table. Come back to the table. Let's talk, let's collectively bargain what we want to, to accomplish in the next contract. Um, this would have no impact on strikes. Oftentimes, Triborough is put forward as the answer to public sector strikes. Taylor law stays in place. It's the Taylor law that makes strikes, strikes illegal. Uh, and this would have no impact on that whatsoever. All we're saying with the Triborough Amendment that we would want to change is contract expires, wages freeze until we have a new contract. Okay? Moving on to the next one, last in, first out. You've heard a lot about this lately. This is a requirement through state law that if school districts have to lay people off, and unfortunately that is what's happening right now, we have one criterion that we are, have to focus in on, and that's seniority. Now, experience matters. Don't get me wrong. The best predictor of future performance is past performance. We want to make sure that we pay, take into account experience, seniority, things of that nature. But we believe other things matter, too. Uh, it's not the only thing that matters and that what we want to do is make sure that seniority is but one factor that is taken into account. We would suggest that there be uh, a, a, that performance as evaluated through an annual professional performance review plan, which is being worked on right now over at the State Education Department, uh, that that come into play when layoff decisions are being made. We would say credentials, one's strengths, uh, one's qualifications, one's experiences come into play. Uh, the needs of a school change over time because the student population changes over time. And as a manager of a school, I may need some a skill set in my workforce that is different than what I've had for many years. I may have a new population who have new needs, and I have people who may not be the most senior people now working here who are able to meet those needs, and I should be able to take that into account. So those credentials of the individuals, as well as the needs of the school or the school district, need to be taken into account as well. So seniority, performance, credentials, and particular pupil and school needs. Next one, 3020A. 3020A is a reference to legislation, a law, that says that you have to go through a particular process when you don't want to discipline uh, and potentially dismiss uh, tenured teachers. We have talked about this before. I think we did a press conference in this very room not that long ago uh, that talked specifically about 3020A. We have five recommendations that are embedded in here that deal with ways in which we believe we can significantly streamline a very expensive, time-consuming process. Uh, we would suggest that the state have in place some sort of a state panel to process 3020As. Right now, both parties have to agree on a hearing officer. That takes an enormous amount of time. It's very complicated. And that's what drives a lot of this. If there was a panel in place where the Commissioner of Education simply said, 3020A has been uh, brought forward, I'm handing it over to this particular hearing officer who is a trained professional in these, these matters who is going to uh, see this through to, uh, to a decision. Uh, that would streamline the time associated with these 3020As significantly. We believe that in certain instances where an individual has been convicted convicted of a criminal offense, such as child abuse or certain other felonies, if they've had their certificate revoked, if they have not gone and gotten their permanent certificate because they've run out of time, we shouldn't have to go through a 3028 to get them off the payroll. That should happen immediately. We have certain indications from certain courts that employees do not have to cooperate fully in the investigation. 
If we had that, if they were compelled to do so, we, frankly, we could probably resolve a lot of these things before we had to go all the way to decision because we would have a better sense of what was the employee's story. But as it is right now, they remain silent in this regard. We believe that there should be a cap on paid suspensions. We have in some instances seen situations where people have been on paid suspension for years. You remember all the stories down in New York City about the rubber rooms that have now gone away. But for years, and the cost, you can see it from our research, we have it from a 2008 data, we have uh, that uh, outside of New York City, these cases going from charges to a final decision, on average, take 502 days at a cost of $216,000. Now, we got to be able to do better than that. Uh, and we think that there should no way, I think one of the ways to do that, if we were to cap the, uh, the limit on how much one could be paid while suspended, that would incent people to get back to the table and get this thing done. And lastly, uh, there is a, a need for what I'm told is called mutual discovery, where there is a reciprocal discovery, excuse me, where you have both parties sharing what their defense is and what their, what their, their line of questioning will be. So those are the sites of things that I am told would significantly, significantly reduce the amount of time and hence the cost of the taxpayers for these 30 20As. The next one up has to do with employee health care contributions. Uh, we have done a lot of research on employee health care contributions and we've come to the conclusion that we would like to see legislation that a new law that would create a maximum employer contribution. We talk a lot about the employee's contribution. What about the employer's contribution? It's a very significant amount. The governor wants to talk about capping property taxes. Well, how about ca capping costs for employers? And in this particular instance, we have a situation where we would recommend that the employer's contribution to the cost for health care insurance for the employee be capped at 85% for individual coverage and 75% for family coverage. This would have a tremendous impact on our costs, which are going up tremendously, anywhere from 10.5% to 11.5% increase just this year alone. Uh, and they're going to continue to go that way as people live longer and now there's all these very expensive technolo technological uh, equipment and tests and things like that that they take advantage of. Uh, but we cap what we, the employer, and hence the taxpayer, will contribute to the health care costs. And we think that will have an impact significantly on this. We would have to, I suspect, apply this to all employees prospectively as we go forward, as we negotiate new contracts. We also, you might note, would suggest that this also applies to retirees. Retiree health care costs are also rising dramatically. And in some communities, the amount of money they're spending on pensions and retiree health care costs actually exceed what they're pre presently spending on their current payroll. So this would also limit or cap what we're going to spend on retiree health care in the future as well. The next one is, has to do with pension options. And here we have actually bring to you an endorsement. Um, we would amend the state law that allows public employees to have one option, a defined benefit plan. And we would uh, say that this proposal that is being put forward by the Empire Center that is headed up by E.J. McMahon, who has done a ton of work in this regard, you know that. Uh, we like this. We think this offers the kind of proposals we're talking about. We're looking for a plan for employees that has sustainability, it has portability, it sh a risk is shared between the employer and the employee, there are, is investment flexibility on the behalf of the employee, and predictability in making budget decisions on behalf of the employer. This Empire Center bill offers up two options. One would be a pure defined contribution plan as opposed to a defined benefit plan. The defined contribution plan basically says the employer is going to pay up to a certain amount and that's it. Uh, we're not going to have, be uh, adjusting to the vagaries of the, the stock market uh, and assuming all the risk. We will pay a, a, a standard amount uh, every day or every year and any adjustments that have to be made are going to be shared by the employer and the employee. There is also uh, in this bill a proposal for a hybrid which is a part defined benefit, defined contribution. It's a complicated bill. It's going to require a lot of work. 
Uh, I know there's already some uh, interest on it from some sponsors in both houses, and some amendments are already being discussed. But we think this is on the right track. It's giving some options that will, again, limit what the employer and the taxpayer are going to contribute to uh, pension costs for public employees. The next one up is special education. Uh, in this particular case, we are aware of the fact that in the, the federal government has the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA. It requires a certain set of obligations, certain programs and services be made available to all students who have disabilities. And we want to make sure that those students are taken care of, they have every opportunity to get a great education and a bright future. And we think IDEA does a real good job of setting forth that floor. Here in New York, we have added about 200 additional mandates on top of IDEA. We have become the most expensive special education program in the country. Our proposal is the following. Two years from now, pick a date, but we're saying two years from now, anything above IDEA is repealed. We take the whole New York plan back to IDEA level, but in the meantime, we put in place a commission of representatives, of people who know a lot about special education, parents, teachers, administrators, educators, students, a wide representative sampling of people, and they determine what of those New York add-ons are worthy to keep on. So we repeal back to IDEA by date certain, but if the commission comes back and they say, well, there are certain things we think need to be retained, they're worthy of keeping, let's do that. Let's make sure we put together a great program that is appropriate for kids. But there's going to be some savings there. There are things on the books right now, and the regents will even admit this, because they're already trying to chip away at some of this. There's things on the books right now that just don't need to be there any longer. We can save big money. This is an area where we're paying, spending 27% of our instructional costs are tied up in special education with 12% of the student population. And you can see one statistic we got in there from school year 0405 to uh, 0809. Our cost for special education went up $3 billion. This is the fastest rising area where we've got right now. We've got to start to find a way to put a hold of, slow down that growth. The last thing we have up there is purchasing. A little mundane, I admit. But here's a situation where we spend $53 billion on public education in this state. We're the only state in the nation, maybe there's one other, New Jersey, that doesn't allow us to open up the markets and participate in national purchasing cooperatives to piggyback on other contracts being let in other states by other municipalities. Everyone else in the country is doing this. This is the way in which uh, the, the economy is working in, in, in purchasing goods and services today. You know, think of the difference between Amazon.com and the Montgomery Ward catalog. That's kind of how we're operating these days. And we're trying to get to a place where we open up the markets so that we can participate in some of those efficiencies and some of those cost savings. At the same time, we want to make sure that we protect certain things. For example, minority and women-owned business. Many school districts, and the state certainly, have an interest in making sure that a number, a percentage of our contracts are let to people who are minority and women-owned businesses. You build that into your specs. If you decide that's something that you want to pay attention to, then you do that. All we're suggesting is give us options. You can still purchase on your own. You can still go through the state contract with OGS, uh, the Office of General Services. Or you can open yourself up to some of these other opportunities that are available to you that many other counties, municipalities, school districts are participating in right, that, right now in countries all, or in states all around the country. I'm going to stop there and open this up to questions. Do you have any questions? So do you think that the, if it were to happen, if the state property tax cap, it can't happen without somebody doing it illegally? Is that something you I didn't mention a property tax cap. Uh, what we have said all along is if a property tax cap uh, comes forward, and we certainly are not ignorant to the fact that the strength for this is building, support for this is building, that you cannot just deal with the revenue side of things. You've cut our state aid. We know the federal aid is drying up. 
Now you're going to tell us that we are limited in what we can raise locally, and you're not going to allow us to do any of these sorts of things on the cost side. You're, 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 you're holding us hostage here. We do believe that this is a better way. We think we can keep our tax levies down uh, significantly with the kind of loss of mandates and cost containment that is embedded in these, uh, these seven issues here. But certainly, if there is a tax cap comes forward, we're going to absolutely have to have this kind of thing to make ends meet. Could, could you put any odds on the uh, chances of a tax cap passing this year? I put no odds on it. Uh, we do know that uh, the, it has already been passed by the Senate. Uh, the governor has been very vocal about his support of that. Uh, and the Assembly has said they're not so interested. We've also heard kind of the theories that the Senate may not be as sincere about it as uh, we've been perhaps led to believe, in that they don't want to negotiate anything differently than what they already have uh, uh, passed. So, you know, at, at this point in time, I think it, it may be actually kind of 50 50. I, I don't know. I see that there are some organizations that are starting to really ramp up. And to what extent they'll be influential in the next two months, I don't know. Well, Tim, sort of on both of these questions, if the tax cap gets passed and none of these changes that you're advocating happen, what's going to be the impact? It's going to be, I think, eventually, what, what you see right now is we're going to the table and we're negotiating concessions. We're using up reserves. When the budgets that have been put forward for the May vote, we're using $1.2 billion in reserves, uh, about $2 million per school district. We are uh, expecting that uh, those will pass, uh, and yet what we're going to find very quickly is that our options are going to be quite limited. Hence where we go next, if none of this happens and we have a tax cap, we're going to have to cut our costs significantly. And you can only go so far before you're laying people off and cutting programs. That's so where we're going to end up. So that's where you see widespread layoffs? And yeah, yeah. And, you know, we're trying to put together these proposals we think are quite reasonable, and they're honestly, I, don't, I won't call them sophisticated, but they're, they're business management. They're, they're proposing things that are smart to, to keep an organization running at full strength and meeting the needs of the community. And, you know, just saying we're going to just lay people off and cut programs is not smart business management. It's not a way to run the railroad, so to speak. Um, which ones of these have you uh, been advocating for in previous years, and, and which ones are new? Uh, well, the ones that, let me, let me go back to the, the list here. Triborough, we have been advocating for quite a while. You're quite, quite aware of that. Last in and first out really didn't come to the fore much before this. Uh, layoffs were not as prevalent as they are right now. And this really, I think, emanated as much as any from emphasis put on this issue by Mayor Bloomberg down in New York City, where he was really pushing for, give me something other than seniority to work with. We think that makes smart, and the people who I represent say, yeah, we could really use that. So that's probably relatively new for us. 3020A, we've been the most prominent uh, advocate for changes with 3020A for years. The employer health care piece, we've always said that is something that is collectively bargained and we respect that. But I have to tell you, the, rate, the rates, the premiums are going up so fast, the costs for health care are going up so fast, we can't keep up with it at the bargaining table. We need a helping hand from the state to give us a floor or a ceiling, whichever way you want to look at it, and say, you don't have to spend any more than 85% on the individual, 75% on the family. We think that would help us out tremendously. That's kind of a new thing for us to really focus in on that particular one. The pension options we've been talking about for several years, uh, we had oftentimes been focused strictly on a defined contribution plan, and we had put forward principles of pension reform and things of that nature. This is the first time we've really locked in on a particular legislation that includes a hybrid, and we like that idea. The, the, what I'm hearing from hybrids that have been started in other states are working quite well. Uh, special education is something that uh, we have talked about a lot. I have to tell you, the people who I represent 
are very, very sensitive about that particular issue. They want to make sure that these kids are taken care of, these people who have special needs, that we accommodate them as best as we can, but those costs are just driving so far. There must be some efficiencies that we just haven't been attending to that we need to do so now. And the purchasing piece, we've been uh, talking about kind of behind the scenes for a couple years now because we do know of all these other state uh, other states that are taking advantage of this. I did some work not long ago down in Texas where they've had a consortium in place now for, I'm going to say like 10 years, and they told me they've saved $4 billion in 10 years. And it's a, it's a consortium of counties, municipalities, and school districts all sharing purchasing practices. Can, can you say, is there an average for uh, how much schools pay right now for uh, employee health care and what, what percentage they're paying? There is. I don't know if I have that information uh, available right now. Uh, I can get that to you. But it's more than what's proposed. It's more it's, it's, what employers are paying. Okay. Is more. Yeah. yeah. If you were to, I can tell you this much. If we were to change it to this eighty-five seventy-five, I think most of the school districts, a majority of the school districts, would be impacted by the eighty-five. I think probably two thirds of them. Uh, Dave Albert's here with me. He may have that information. Great session on the payments and coverage for health care. It's on average, the school contributes 90% for the individual plan. There you go. 88% for the family. There you go. Thank you. If I remember, about two thirds of the school districts would be paying uh, the school. Con con school districts contribu contributions would go down for the individual, but about 96% of them would go down for the family plan because no, there are very few that are at that 75% so contribution. The state for money with this employer. With the employer no. cap, you're saying that it would be the employees that pay on that. That's right. That's right. This is just, a, and, and this is in line with probably everyone in this room is probably participating in a health care plan where your contribution is more than, you know, it's probably in that line of that 25% or maybe even 35%. Because uh, uh, that, uh, I think statewide or nationwide, I think what we have here from the Kaiser Fam uh, Family Foundation, uh, Dave, help me out here. Uh, I think that they're uh, uh, on average 81% uh, for single coverage is the average. 70% for family coverage, all employees nationwide. Um, that's what the contribution is typically for the employer. Tim, are you engaged in any specific uh, negotiations on the tax cap and urban service negotiation? And do you want any additional reduction in the tax in the next uh, We have not engaged uh, in negotiations per se, negotiations. We certainly have uh, had many a discussion with leaders uh, about our concerns about the tax cap, uh, the fact that you can't have a tax cap without mandate relief. And we've talked pro pretty much in more generalities than sitting down and having any formal negotiations. I will say that. And your second part of your question? Do you want exemptions? exemptions. exemptions. We're very concerned about exemptions, quite honestly. And that, sound, that might sound a little odd. But what we're worried about is the exemptions. Let's say, as they've done in New Jersey, health care and pensions are exempted. So now, let's say there's a tax cap in place, and it's 2%. Now the local school board comes forward, and they've got a 3 or 3.5 or 4% proposal. And they say, well, we're legitimately allowed to do that because we have these exemptions for health care and pensions. The state has effectively backed away, put all of this on us at the local level, and believe me, the school board will be right in the crosshairs on this thing. We'll get hammered on these exemptions. So I don't think it's a good idea. I think uh, creating a cap with exemptions is going to get us in the same problem we're going we're to have if we have a cap with no exemptions. Will this be like the May 17th um, school board school budget vote um, thing? I saw a couple of different numbers last week about like the tax, average tax increase. I think your number was lower than Average spending increase is 1.3% across the board statewide, um, which means that school districts are being very, very conservative as to what they're going to spend. And they're using reserves, and they're doing other ways to keep that spending down. 
And the, that equates to an average tax levy increase, by our calculation, of 3.4 percent, which is evidence of the fact that when you get your state aid cut, then you're going to, and you've got to try to make ends meet, you're going to have to turn somewhere. We only got state and federal aid, local taxes, and what we can do within our budget. That's only three buckets we've got. And so we're going out, I think on average, it's about 3.4 percent across, uh, across the state. And, I'm sorry. And, and, you're, and to answer your question, we always say, you know, we, go, we check back to 1967, and on average it's been over 83 percent has been the passage rate. Of late, the last few years, it's been well over 90. And I'm thinking with the kinds of uh, what I believe to be a relatively conservative uh, approach. I think school districts will recognize uh, what school boards have done in putting these spending plans together. I think we're going to be over 90 percent in our passage rate. Well, outside of New York City, I, I don't know if this is outside of New York City or inside New York City. We've seen some pretty high numbers that have come out of the New, New York State United Teachers. Our Honestly, uh, you know, pulling it out of thin air kind of estimate is somewhere between 6,000 and 10,000, depending upon whether or not these budgets pass on May 17th. If the budgets go down, layoff numbers go up. Budgets pass, layoff numbers go down. So at a minimum, it's still be 6,000 layoffs? You know, that's, that, that's, a, that's a real guesstimate. We did some surveying. We saw what people were putting into their budgets as far as the pink slips that they had put out. Those pink slips may be retracted if the budgets pass and you don't have anywhere near those kind of layoffs. But it could happen. Uh, we're hopeful not. Is that teachers? That's all employees. Pat, do you have any comment on what maybe Governor Cuomo said last week? And I'm trying to remember how to go on vacation last week, too. But then something about uh, even in the years when school aid increased, Well, he has said, you know, there is some truth in the fact, he says state aid has gone up and at the same time we've gone out there and we've gotten higher support from our, our local taxpayers and, and spending in total has gone up. Some of that was a, a function of this campaign for fiscal equity lawsuit where state was forced to pay more at a time when the school districts were going out. But if you look at the numbers, you find that, and he, he says when our state contribution goes down, the local school the locals go out there and, and, and seek less. They cut their spending. Uh, I think you can do that for a little while. We've been very sensitive to the fact that we're in a recessionary time. But I don't think you can do that for much longer. And uh, I do believe there will come a time if he keeps, if, if we tax, uh, if, if we continue to cut state aid and continue to keep the, a spending cap in place, that there will become a time when we're going to have to have significant spending cuts that will result in program cuts and layoffs, because we just won't have anywhere else to turn. But you're not there yet. We're, uh, we're getting there in some of these smaller communities where they really don't have anywhere else to turn. You have some of these small rural poor communities where their commercial tax base is non-existent. The property values of the people who live there is going down. Uh, many of them are strapped. You know, many of them are out of work. Some of them uh, just simply can't afford another penny. So yeah, you have some of these communities where they're really up against the wall. Um, but that's not universal. And uh, yet I think another year, maybe two, we're, we're all up against the wall. Anything else? Thank you very much.